By the time April 1992 rolled around, the battle lines in Bosnia were drawn. The former Soviet Republic communist country of Yugoslavia was politically in its death throes due to a combination of nationalism and economic issues and social issues that we covered in the last episode. And different areas and republics inside of Yugoslavia were beginning to splinter off, declare independence, and form their own countries, mostly based on ethnicity. So Croatia had already split off to form their own Croat state. They fought a war with Serbia to do it. Slovenia also declared independence, split off from Yugoslavia. And in 1991 and 1992, Bosnian politicians and the Bosnian people were advocating and doing the same thing, an independent Bosnia. But the difference in Bosnia was that whereas a place like Croatia or Slovenia or Serbia was very much predominantly one ethnicity, for example, Croatia was mostly Croat, Serbia was mostly Serb people, in Bosnia, it was much more of a mix of ethnicities. It was more of a melting pot. As we went over in the last episode, that's the way Bosnia had always been. There was never a one unifying religion or one unifying ethnicity. It was always kind of a land of crossroads where multiple different peoples were welcome. Different religions, for the most part, were respected. Different ethnicities could come and people could live together in Bosnia. But not everybody shared that vision of a cosmopolitan, united, and mixed Bosnia. By April of 1992, extreme Serb nationalists had effectively split off from the elected Bosnian government in the hopes of forming their own territory inside of Bosnia strictly for Serbs. And this territory would be known as Greater Serbia, where only Serbs could live and the rest of Bosnia would be split up, partitioned in terms of ethnicity. So Muslims could live in some spots and Serbs and others, Croats and other spots, but there could be no mixing because this was the view of the Serb nationalists that these people didn't fit together and they could never live together successfully or peacefully. Looking back, it seems like there was two different approaches to how to organize society. The more you think about it, the more you realize that these two approaches continue to be in conflict even in modern day politics. And it seems like the lessons of this war are not necessarily being learned in certain places around the world. But the two different approaches are the Serb nationalist approach, which is basically the approach of nationalism, which typically advocates for the old philosophy of nation states. One people, one culture, together in one territory, connected with each other. Author Tom Jelton, who I quoted a little bit last episode, and I probably should have mentioned he wrote a book called Sarajevo Daily. He was there in Sarajevo as the war was breaking out, uh, reporting. Here's what he has to say about this approach of organizing a country by nationalism. Quote, The Serb nationalists had a radically different notion of democracy and statehood. Given the history of ethnic conflict in the Yugoslav lands, they claimed, the Serbs in Bosnia required constitutional protection not as individuals, but as a nation. This could be achieved, they argued, only if they had their own state and could live separately from non-Serbs, end quote. The argument is that because Serbs had been treated poorly in previous times, whether it was World War II or whether it was under the Ottoman Empire or whether it was, you know, sometime in the past, because of those previous injustices, that means that the Serbs as a people have to band together and protect each other and be treated as a group in order to protect everybody best. Typically, for an extreme nationalist, this means that multiculturalism is a bad thing. 
And you can listen to the leader of this Bosnian Serb movement, Radovan Karavic, who I should say, kind of as a postscript, is now sitting in jail for his actions during this war. But he's against multiculturalism, and he sees the country of Bosnia, where Muslims and Serbs and Croats were all mixing together, and where different religions and different peoples were able to live side by side, he saw this as a negative thing. So Karavic said, quote, We in Bosnia have never considered ourselves other than Serbs, Croats, and Muslims. There is no Bosnian patriotism. There is no Bosnian nation. There is just a common home for three peoples, end quote. So that's one way to look at the world and to organize a country and to organize a society. But the other way and the way that the Bosnian government wanted and the people who fought for the Bosnian government and the people in Sarajevo for the most part wanted was instead of the idea of nationalism and instead of the idea of a nation state, these people advocated more for a civil state. Author Tom Jelton says, quote, implicit in such a view was the idea of a civil state where the rights of citizenship extend automatically to anyone born in the country without regard to ethnic or religious background, end quote. Another way to think about it is the difference between nationalism, where your people come first, your culture comes first, your identity comes first, and then you can worry about other people, versus the idea of humanism, where with a humanistic perspective, you're more focused on, look, we're all human beings in this together, so why wouldn't we extend the same rights and the same principles and the same constitutional protections to all peoples, regardless of ethnicity or religion. On the other hand, it seems like nationalism, and at least extreme nationalism, sort of forces you into a box. It forces you to pick an identity. It forces you into sort of an us-versus-them mentality, because if you have to pick your identity, then naturally there's going to be people outside of that circle that you have to view as sort of different from you, sort of like the others. A man named Ivo Knisevich was in Sarajevo. He taught philosophy at Sarajevo University, and he said, quote, My biggest disappointment is how I've been forced against my will to be aware of my nationality at all. I can't think as a Croat. It's not the way I'm connected to people. I have human relations, not national or religious relations, end quote. His wife, Gordana, chimed in as well, saying that she felt like the Bosnian Serb political separatist movement was, quote, forcing people to choose an identity. We are no longer allowed to act simply as human beings, end quote. Ultimately, that's going to be what this war is about, this conflict between the idea of a civil state where society is organized based on higher principles and treating people as individuals rather than as groups and using a humanistic framework to put values and principles as the things that guide society versus this idea of a nationalist state where ethnicity and the nation and the culture that's the number one thing, and everything else filters down from there. For Radovan Karavic and the Bosnian Serb cause, the more they could get people to think in terms of us against them and in terms of ethnic strife and ethnic division, the more they would prove what they thought was their central sort of thesis, which is that the different ethnicities of Bosnia should be separated because they can't mix. Karavic said, quote, Tito threw us together. We were like oil and water. While he shook us, we stayed together. Once we were left alone, we separated. End quote. The problem for Karavic and the Bosnian Serb cause was that they had something important staring right at them which totally refuted everything they were saying. And that something was the city of Sarajevo. Sarajevo was founded hundreds of years ago by the Ottoman Turks, and it was always a place where 
different ethnicities, different religions, different peoples, Serb, Croat, Muslim, could live together. If you took a walk down the streets of Sarajevo in 1991 or 1992, you would see mosques and churches right next to each other, within yards. You would see that 34% of the marriages in Sarajevo were inter-ethnic, meaning that this was a place where different peoples could come together and coexist peacefully. So the very existence of Bosnia, the very existence of Sarajevo, was something that was sort of a thorn in the side of the Bosnian Serb cause. And it sort of proved that we don't have to organize based on nationalism. We can do things based on principles and values and treating people like individuals. It can be done. So for Radovan Karavic and the Bosnian Serb nationalists, part of the goal of the Bosnian War was simply to break Sarajevo destroy the city, get people to splinter off into ethnic partitions, get each person to hate one another enough that they're willing to move into these ethnic partition zones, and that's how you win this war for the Bosnian Serbs. With this in mind, it's no surprise that on April 6, 1992, Serb nationalists allied with Radovan Karavic on the upper floor of the Holiday Inn in Sarajevo, opened fire on demonstrators in the street who were advocating for a independent and united Bosnia. Six people were killed, others were wounded. The Western world was seeing this on the news, innocent civilians being sniped, gunned down in the streets of Sarajevo, and the Western world was outraged. And while there had been some violence in eastern Bosnia over the previous couple of days, most people see this as sort of the beginning of the Bosnian War. For the next couple of years, the rebel Bosnian Serbs surrounded, sieged, bombed, shelled, and attempted to destroy Sarajevo. By the time it was over, the siege of Sarajevo would end with 9,000 Sarajevans dead, of that number, about 1,500 kids killed. The Bosnian Serbs seem to have no problems aiming at civilians, intentionally targeting areas based on ethnicity and targeting Muslim areas as opposed to other areas of the city. Again, the goal was to break the will of the Sarajevan people, to make them understand that this was not a place where people could live together in their view. They wanted Sarajevo to be broken down in this idea of a united and cosmopolitan city to be destroyed. Author Tom Jelton says, quote, Over and over, Serb artillery gunners targeted water lines, food distribution points, and other places where crowds might gather. The aim was to demoralize the population and to force the city's surrender. But Sarajevans resisted. End quote. The people of Sarajevo during the Bosnian War went through just unconscionable things. They saw their family members and their children be killed or wounded. They saw their buildings be shelled and destroyed. They saw their food supply completely dry up. They saw bedrooms and kitchens and family rooms turn into bomb shelters. But through it all, the ordinary people of Sarajevo persevered, and in defense of a humanistic ideal, even though they were battered and bruised, they came through on the other side. Shortly after the Holiday Inn shooting incident, the war was on in Bosnia. And you have to remember that through the political maneuverings of Slobodan Milosevic and his control of Serbia and really his control of what used to be Yugoslavia, most of the Yugoslav army was now firmly under his control and was pretty firmly Serb. So... Essentially, the Yugoslav army was now the Bosnian Serb army. So this put the government of Bosnia at a huge disadvantage. 
the Bosnian Serb nationalist cause had most of the tanks, most of the guns, most of the planes, most of the weapons. And within about a month, the Bosnian Serb army controlled about 65% of Bosnian territory. And of course, the siege of Sarajevo was on as well. Shelling of the city went on day and night. There was sniper fire in the streets. Shops had to close down. Serbs blockaded roads into and out of the city so that it became difficult to ship food, medicine, supplies into the city. And ultimately, it was dangerous simply to walk around. In the first two weeks of this war, 90 people were killed in Sarajevo simply from gunshots or from shrapnel. Part of this has to do with sort of the geography of Sarajevo. It's kind of in a little bit of a valley with hills surrounding it on the outside. So Bosnian Serb forces were able to take the hilltops and set up their heavy weapons there and their snipers there. And essentially they were able to just bomb and shell at will. Some people left the city. Radovan Karavic encouraged all Serbs to leave the city, but not all Serbs did. Some certainly did before the war broke out, kind of sensing what was going on, but many Serbs in Bosnia and many Serbs in Sarajevo didn't buy into this nationalistic fervor, and they just wanted to live their lives with their neighbors and their friends like they always had. As always, you don't want to just lump all of the Serbs or all the Muslims or all the Croats together into one group when talking about them because each person is an individual and some Serbs stayed in Sarajevo simply to send a message that they didn't agree with what Karavic and Milosevic and this Bosnian Serb nationalist cause was doing. At any rate, the people who stayed in the city, either by choice or not by choice, had to work, they had to protect their families, and they had to continue living under what was essentially total war conditions. Gordana Knezovic, who we quoted earlier, worked in Sarajevo at the Oslobodzhenia newspaper, which was a newspaper that became famous as being essentially the last newspaper in Bosnia to advocate for a pluralistic and integrated society. And we'll get there later in the story, but she said, quote, it was unbearable. I felt I had to do both things, care for my family and do my job. I thought both responsibilities were terribly important. Once you are a journalist, you cannot give it up just because there's a war going on. But you can't stop being a mother either. End quote. Right off the bat, as the city is getting shelled and people are getting sniped and innocent victims are falling in the streets and blood is pooling in the parks of Sarajevo, Psychologically, people had to decide, how are we going to handle this situation? It's dangerous to go to work. It's dangerous to stay at home. You have to care for your kids. Some people sent their kids away. And that was sort of like a double-edged sword where it's, on the one hand, you're getting your kid out of harm's way, potentially. But on the other hand, you're forcing separation of families and that's going to take a toll over the course of years and years of war. As Serb nationalists continued to bomb the city and attempt to break the morale and stow ethnic conflict, once again, their goal was to get the city partitioned among ethnic lines. Serb neighborhoods, Muslim neighborhoods, Croat neighborhoods, and they wanted to cut the city in half, basically, and split it up. And the people of Sarajevo had to live under this siege. Certain areas of the city were more dangerous than others, and it could change based on the Bosnian Serb military, strategic, and psychological objectives. There was one road near the Holiday Inn that was dubbed Sniper Alley by foreign journalists, but really everywhere was dangerous. Food was sparse, the shelling was continuous, the sniper fire against civilians deliberately inspired terror. It wasn't uncommon at all to hide in basements for months, weeks, or even years. A woman named Senka, who also worked at the Oslo Virginia newspaper, said, quote, We look more like animals each day, wild or domestic, depending on the day. We live as in cages, 
pacing from wall to wall, captured and helpless, end quote. It's easy to see why people felt this way. Obviously, you had the paranoia of just crossing the street becoming a dangerous activity and you're worried about you or your kids getting sniped or shelled. I read stories about people opening their front door to pick up the newspaper and just by random happenstance and luck, that's where the shell landed that day and all of a sudden you lost your wife because she opened the front door at the wrong time. On May 27th, something known as the Vazimiskin Massacre occurred. Bosnian Serb artillery shells fired into a crowd of people waiting in line for bread. 22 people were killed, dozens more injured. Once again, the Western world was outraged, but perplexed as to what to do by this situation. The carnage of this attack was probably what you might imagine, but this story in particular of a father and his daughter really hits home. Author Tom Jelton paints the picture here saying, quote, The man's name was Hilmo Korjenic. He had just bought some ice cream for his 10-year-old daughter, Anissa, and was waiting for bread when the mortars landed. I was last in line, he told Oslo Virginia reporter Vlado Merkic, who tracked him down weeks later in the hospital. And here's what the man who was at the massacre told that reporter, quote, As soon as I stepped up, it flashed. Nothing else. I looked around but saw no one. Where are the people? Then I saw them, all flattened, wailing, screaming, howling. I didn't immediately see that both my legs were gone. They were straight in front of me, and it looked to me as if they were complete. My shoes were still on, everything. When I saw those people, I said to myself, I'm going to die too. So I lay down and closed my eyes. And then my little daughter, Anissa, appeared. I leaned up to see what she was doing there, but when I opened my eyes, she was nowhere. That's what saved me. I called for help then, and all the way to the hospital. I was telling myself, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Anissa kept me alive. If she had not appeared, I would have bled to death because all those people who did not call for help just lay down and bled and died, end quote. The reporter for Oslo, Virginia, summed up that story by saying, quote, There are no words big enough either to console or to condemn. Life will go on because it has to. Time will wipe away the memories because it is stronger than anything. But the shadow of the crime we have witnessed will remain for all days to come, end quote. That story hits close to home, but you have to remember that that was just life for thousands of people in Sarajevo every day. That's what they went through. That's what they saw. That's what they did. As these shells and as these sniper bullets were falling into Sarajevo, it was actually recommended that you don't stop to help a sniper victim, at least not in the open, as you were probably going to be next if you stopped to help. Many simply did their job as a way to go on with life and have some sort of normalcy. Many joined the Bosnian army fighting against the Bosnian Serb army. But many also didn't want to join the army. Some people just simply aren't killers. They can't do it. One reporter named Vladimir said, quote, When I saw we were entering war, I knew people would be divided into two groups, those who could kill and those who couldn't. I was one of those who couldn't, end quote. It reminds me a little bit of the old Brandon Sanderson line from The Way of Kings where he says, you can't kill to protect. And the Bosnian War would certainly put that statement to the test. As the days wound on and as the siege continued, For many people in Sarajevo, life became simply about survival. People lost track of the day of the week or the month or even the time of day as they were hunkered down in their shelters. And you just sort of had this attitude of survival. Do whatever it takes to survive. 
But for some, there was sort of this depressing idea of fatalism that began to take place because it almost didn't seem to matter what you did. You could end up dead at any moment. You could get hit walking down the street. You could get hit in your own kitchen. You could get hit opening your front door to get the newspaper. But on the other hand, sometimes you wouldn't get hit as you're waiting in line for bread or UN handouts or UN supplies. So sometimes people didn't feel as if they had control over the situation, and of course they didn't. Author and journalist Tom Jelton talks about this. He says, quote, I was often struck in Sarajevo by what seemed to me to be foolish behavior during periods of shelling, such as people standing in line for hours to get a pack or two of cigarettes when they should logically have been terrified to be out of doors. If the shell or bullet has your name on it, a vendor in an open-air market once told me, it will get you even in your home in bed with the covers pulled over your head. If one were to remain active in Sarajevo, one became a fatalist. End quote. And it's hard to blame some of these people for becoming fatalists with just the miserable conditions they were living in. The only thing worse than the start of this siege in 1992 was as it continued and it started to get into the winter months. The Serb army had cut off the gas, so it became very difficult for people to stay warm in what is very harsh winter conditions in Bosnia. People had to collect firewood. They went to parks to cut down trees. They waited in soup lines. They looked for somewhere else to live if their house was destroyed. People even turned to ripping up their floorboards in order to stay warm and burning those floorboards. Life was tough and depressing for many. People often withdrew, tried to stay indoors, stay as warm as you can, and focused on protecting their own families. And it could be a lonely and depressing existence. This is how most of Sarajevo lived, especially during the winter, during the siege of Sarajevo. There was often certain variables that could even further complicate life in Sarajevo, and one of those variables was having a baby. There was never enough water, warmth, or diapers to go around, and the little things that we here today take for granted on an everyday basis were not things that people in Sarajevo had, and they had to work and earn those little things just to survive. Author Tom Jelton, as he interviewed members of the Oslo Virginia newspaper about their lives in Sarajevo during this time, talks about life with a baby here, and he's going to mention some names uh, of the people who are working for the paper, but he says, quote, When they got up in the night to change little Maya's diapers by candlelight, it was so cold they could see their breath. They bundled the baby as best they could. Maya learned on her own that she was warmest sleeping on her stomach. Elementary baby care involved hours of work and great ingenuity. Dubrovka figured out how to make diaper covers from the plastic wrapping of toilet paper packages. Vladimir was kept busy finding firewood and water. There was a public tap in the neighborhood, but he had to stand in line for a turn and then haul jug after jug up to their third floor apartment with a baby whose diapers always needed laundering, plus two adults who had to eat, drink, and keep clean, the water never lasted long. Always hungry, short of sleep, and working six or seven days a week at his Oslo Virginia job, Vladimir soon caught a winter cold that turned into pneumonia. By the end of the winter, he weighed only 130 pounds, down from 180 before the war. His cheeks were hollow, his arms were spindly, and his collarbone stood out sharply through his shirt. End quote. I think I read somewhere that the average person in Sarajevo lost about 25 pounds over the course of the war. Life was incredibly difficult for the people of Sarajevo. Furthermore, in order to get supplies or food or diapers for your baby, you had to get that stuff. And in a world where total war is the norm, money became less valuable. So people turned to the barter system. Cigarettes became useful as an item for trade in order to trade for stuff like firewood or stoves to use as heating. 
water, kindling, candles, the types of things you need to survive in the dark without water, without power, without sewage, without anything. So there was sort of the logistical aspect of survival and how do we actually make this work from that perspective, but there was also the psychological aspect of the paranoia and the uncertainty and sort of the fatalism that we talked about earlier. For example, let's say you're walking down the street and a shell goes off near you. What do you do? Do you run forward faster or do you stop and run backwards? You don't know which way the shells are going. You're going to have to make a decision arbitrarily and this could decide your life. One person describes this exact situation, quote, I never know whether to hurry or slow down because you could be heading toward it or it could land behind you, end quote. There was the paranoia of being attacked by shells or sniped and killed, but given that Serb nationalist political goals were to tear the city apart, divide it into ethnic zones in order to win the war, Sarajevans had to maintain their culture and their togetherness and their sense of community which is incredibly difficult to do in a total war situation. For the most part, the people of Sarajevo managed to do that. They maintained their routines. They commemorated the victims of bombings and shellings with ceremonies. They continued to do the things that they always did. Listen to music, go to restaurants, run in the streets, train athletically, if that's what they did, listen to the radio. Obviously, there was limitations on all of that stuff, but Sarajevans did the best they could. But of course, sometimes the other side of the coin landed, and there was some ethnic struggle, and there was some ethnic mistrust. Sometimes there was feelings of betrayal from a friend or a loved one who left to go over to the Bosnian Serb territory. You're left in that old zone that you have for old friends where you're not sure if it was genuine, if it ever meant something, or if things have changed so much where now those old memories don't mean anything anymore. One woman wrote an open letter to her boyfriend that left to go to the Bosnian Serb side. Quote, How do you feel this morning without these dear persons here on this sunny side of mine? Do you think of us sometimes? Are you thinking of us while you shoot at my windows? While you destroy the playground in front of my building? You know that your side shelled the nursery. How did you stand it? You who like all children as if they were your own. How could you be with these people when they threw the shells on Bazamiskin Street? On this sunny side of mine, people are still the same. They love and suffer. On this side of mine, I have to let you know you are no longer allowed. It is too late now to change your mind, to transform you. Too much evil has been sown, too much bloodshed. I've dreamed of you, and now I've finished dreaming of you. I'll never write to you again. End quote. It's a great passage there because I think it perfectly exemplifies probably the feeling we've all had at one point or another, that feeling of betrayal or abandonment from a friend or a loved one, and the feeling of looking back on the past fondly, but also knowing it's time to move on. And then you take that complicated, nostalgic feeling and you throw that in the middle of one of the most brutal wars of the 20th century, and that letter is what you get. Feelings like this did get intensified at times, and there was some paranoia about Serbs who decided to keep living in Sarajevo. Were they a security threat? It seems natural to worry that that could be possible. And ultimately, you did have some murders and some killings that seemed ethnically charged. Some Muslim criminals and paramilitaries at times killed innocent Serbs who didn't deserve it. Sometimes apartments of Serbs were searched, people were questioned, sometimes by the government, but often by quote-unquote militia and paramilitaries, basically ragtag defense forces that were enlisted to protect the city. But in general, the official Bosnian government 
denounced this type of stuff. And if they had evidence of somebody committing a murder or doing something immoral, in general, they did their best to bring that person to justice. It was never perfect, and this was a time of war, but the Bosnian government, from that perspective, looks a heck of a lot better than the other side, the Bosnian Serb leaders and their government, when it comes to these atrocities. First of all, percentage-wise, Bosnian Serbs committed more atrocities against Muslims by a significant number, and obviously we'll get to the, the genocide and that type of stuff later, but this siege of Sarajevo, all those shells, all those sniper bullets were targeted specifically at Muslims for the most part and innocent civilians. And there's just an abundance of evidence that shows that the top leadership, whether it was Radovan Karavic or the general Rako Mladic or even dog whistling by Slobodan Milosevic, there's an abundance of evidence that shows the top leadership was actively targeting civilians or implying that civilians should be actively targeted. The top leadership of the Bosnian Serbs goaded people on with this ethnic conflict and ethnic cleansing. Heck, their whole political platform was ethnic cleansing. In the east part of Bosnia, they began moving Muslims out of their homes and essentially just clearing them out of territories. And if they refused, oftentimes they were killed. We're going to get to East Bosnia and what happened there and the ethnic cleansing there that was essentially official government policy by the Bosnian Serb government. In this episode, we're going to be focusing more on Sarajevo like we've done so far, but we'll get there. At any rate, the psychological torment and the paranoia and the feelings of betrayal from neighbors and friends were evident in Sarajevo, but overall, most people in Sarajevo did a good job to, one, survive, two, uphold their morals for the most part, and three, uphold the value of a inter-ethnic pluralistic society that's based on values and principles that means something. But the price for upholding those values and living by those principles was high. It seemed like the Oslo Bajenia newspaper had a bigger and bigger section every day when it came to the obituaries. The Oslo Bajenia newspaper made an effort to keep it simple and have it just be a simple, poignant memory of the dead. Quote, In painful memory of our beloved brother, Farid, son of Miho Palav, Dear brother, words cannot express the sadness and the pain that your parting has left in my heart, but as long as I live, your memory will be with me. Forgive me for not having been able to organize your burial as I would have liked but you were so magnificent that any burial would have been too modest for you. With love, your sister, Farida. End quote. Quote, 20 December, a week of intense suffering since the death of our dear Ismet, son of Ibra. Dear Ismet, it is difficult to accept your absence. Time can do nothing to ease the pain we have felt since your parting. You have left behind in our hearts a feeling of emptiness, but we will never lose our cherished memories of your generosity or of your beloved face, always smiling and radiant. We will love you always, your family, your wife, Serenata, and daughter, Najira. End quote. Reading stuff like that, it's obvious that the people of Sarajevo paid a price that they shouldn't have had to pay. 